Hi, everybody. Welcome to Promoting Agritourism Growth. I hope you're all in the right place. There's only one of me doing moderation and session hosting, but I want to get it started so that we have a smooth experience. This is a long session, so thank you all for being here. Um, if one of you ladies at the back wouldn't mind closing the door, that would be fantastic for the ambient noise. My name is Andrew Graham. I work for the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont, and I manage the Vermont Farmers Market Association. And our first presenter this afternoon is Nicole Vaujois of Vancouver Island University, who will be talking about supporting investment decisions for farms interested in diversification through agritourism. Hello and welcome to this session. My name is Nicole Beaujois and I'm coming to you from beautiful Vancouver Island, Canada. Happy here to talk to you today about supporting investment decisions for farms uh, that are interested in diversification through agritourism. I'm hoping to take you on a journey like in this photo and hold out a carrot to invite further conversation about farm decision making related to agritourism. This is a brief overview of what I'll cover in the next 15 minutes. As more farmers contemplate options to diversify farm operations and remain viable, the interest in agritourism is likely to continue to increase. Diversification refers to the reallocation of some of a farm's productive resources, such as land, capital, farm, equipment, and labor, to other products, uh, to, uh, from other products to non-farm activities. Farm diversification decisions are complex, but include motivations such as the desire to reduce risk and exposure to farm operations, capitalize on shifts in consumer demands, or respond to government policy, external shocks, and more recently, threats to associated to climate change. Decisions to diversify through agritourism requires that farmers understand and make complex decisions about the extent of exposure to tourism that they want their farm operation to have and the potential return on investment. To date, the academic literature has provided limited assistance to aid in navigating them in these decisions. Farmers need to know what the risks associated to different types of agritourism activities are how it will impact their farm operations, and what the potential return on investment is. Answers to these questions will enable them to make better risk-reward decisions and enable them to understand the exposure risks associated to tourism so that they can optimize benefits while minimizing impacts. This presentation, I hope, will describe how the exposure investment return continuum I developed can be used to facilitate decision-making with agritourism operations. This continuum was developed in consultation with agritourism operators in British Columbia in a series of workshops that identified the types of questions that farmers were grappling with at different stages of agritourism development. The presentation will highlight future research questions on both the demand and supply side and a set of propositions to guide researchers um, to uh, help them inform uh, agritourism operations. So I'm going to start, as you can see here, with a little bit of background and context about the diversification imperative in agriculture using Canada as the case study context. I'll throw a few definitions out there because uh, an academic wouldn't be an academic without doing that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about that risk reward decision process. I will talk. I'll talk with a recap of the current reality of the family farm in Canada to set the stage for how agritourism activity fits into the broader picture of agriculture today. This is a quote, uh, a little bit dated now, but it's, it remains very constant for us that there's still tremendous concern relating to the stress and uncertainty within agriculture and, and particularly how it impacts the family farm. Major concerns for us, with, supported by statistics that you'll hear about in a moment, is the replacement of the family farm, corporate farms, 
financial barriers that are preventing our young people from entering farming, increasing regulation burdens from various ministries on farms, farming and farmland, and a, really a lack of understanding about the importance of agriculture and the benefits that it holds for society. These are a few stats for those that are unfamiliar with the Canadian con uh, context. In 2016, in our census of agriculture, we had 271,000, 272,000 uh, farm operators on operations. This was down uh, from our previous census. Our, our gross farm uh, receipts on average, um, you know, where uh, farms are incurring 83 cents in expenses uh, for an expense receipt ratio of about 0.83 cents. So this is a, a challenging operating environment. Uh, it's a uh, highly uh, capital intensive. 44% uh, of all farm operators did some off farm work, usually a way of, of supplementing their farm income. And you can see there that just over three in 10 uh, operators worked on average 30 hours a week or more off the farm, which is significant. Um, that's almost a full, a full work week off, so off the farm. Our average age edged up from 54 years in 2011 to 55 years in 2016, probably similar to other contexts. Um, and despite the increase in average age, only one in 12 operations reported having any sort of a succession plan, um, indicating how things will sort of be transferred out. At farm operators under 35, uh, first time, uh, we had a first absolute increase in this category of operators since 1991, which is optimistic. So suffice to say, it's a challenging landscape and the imperative for diversification in Canada is, uh, is really a prominent. A couple of definitions before we keep going. Um, I, I highlighted this earlier in the preface, but farm diversification is really about reallocating some of a, a farm's productive resources uh, into other products for non-farming activities. Um, some of those diversification options are introducing new products, using new outlets to sell farm products, um, tourism and recreation, um, either on or off uh, farm um, development. So converting some of that land into other, um, other uh, revenue streams or looking at uh, various forms of energy, wind, solar, and oil. Agritourism has been promoted as a tool that can that can diversify for both financial and non-financial reasons. So while many of the indicators I've given you are, have been financial, um, one of the key motivators for a lot of uh, particularly small family farms is that um, you know they're looking to agritourism as a potential to keep the family alive uh, by creating new revenue streams and keeping younger people invested in the farm. We mentioned agritourism. There's lots of definitions that range quite a lot in scope, and I know people on this call will be are very familiar with those. Um, I've, I've simply boiled down for me, agritourism is defined as tourism that supports agriculture. And I do this because it's really agriculture that's the key and tourism is the means to supporting uh, active uh, farming and agriculture uh, viability. So as I've highlighted earlier, to diversify through agritourism or not, this is a, it's a complex risk reward assessment processes. Um, and we need to, you know, we need to sort of understand some of the context that farms are operating in. I've been a lifelong farmer, still am. And, uh, and, and so this, I live by uh, some of these observations daily. Uh, our farms operate in a very high risk environment. Um, revenues influenced by a range of externalities that they can't control, uh, weather, which is a big one for many of us around the world, uh, commodity prices, trade agreements, um, and, and they're exposed to risks in their daily operations, such as potential injury to employees, valve safety hazards, equipment failure. Um, so a lot of externalities, a lot of things that can happen on the farm um, that really put them in a vulnerable position. Tourism uh, also exposes farms to new risks such as liability associated to visitor injuries, reputational risks, uh, and other financial exposure where they're taking some of that non-farm income and investing it into agritourism. Uh, if that doesn't work, it, it, it creates another sort of a, a risk for them that they're 
um, uh, obviously motivated to um, want to sort out before they make a decision to go this way. The literature on agritourism is scant, particularly in Canada. Uh, we know from US studies that their uh, agritourism has significant and positive effects. Um, this is one that many people are probably aware of, you know, and I pulled one quote here. Uh, you know, agritourism has statistically significant and positive effects on farm profitability. Um, and we know that that is highest amongst small farms operated by individuals primarily engaged in farming. Um, and so, you know, we're able to sort of convey working with uh, with farmers that uh, there's there's the potential for reward, um, but when they ask what are the potential for risks, uh, we, we struggle. Suffice to say, farms contemplating whether or not to invest precious capital into diversification have limited information to help them. Answers such as these questions um, uh, shown are difficult given our current knowledge. So farms are asking, what are the risks associated to different types of activities? Um, what is the potential return on investment uh, associated to agritourism? Uh, how will engaging in agritourism impact the daily operations of our farm? Uh, for those of you that know the literature, um, we have, uh, we're, we're not equipped to fully answer those questions yet. In 2017, I was asked to develop BC's first manual to guide farm diversification decisions for farmers. We did a scoping exercise, assembling nu numerous manuals from other states and provinces in Europe where language allowed. We also searched the academic literature. A gap we noticed in others was the focus on the design and delivery of memorable experiences. So we framed ours in a staged cycle from design, a decision to design. Uh, this manual has been used to design and deliver a number of workshops here in BC where farmers have provided constructive feedback, they've asked some key driving questions, and they've uh, provided observations on the process and the content. The manual shares some of the classic benefits and costs that we found via a review of the literature, and these won't be unfamiliar to people on this call. You know, agritourism, uh, when we're trying to help people make a decision, we're noting that you know, it can increase farm resiliency and generate some off-season revenue and provide some additional farm opportunities and income. And we also tend to flag the potential costs, so, uh, you know, rezoning and application fees, uh, additional investments, um, interference with other farm activities, potential neighbor and nuisance complaints. So, you know, these lists are, are helpful to farmers, but they really don't sort of uh, help provide any gradation of, uh, of, of where the costs um, potentially lie. We noted to farmers in our manual that um, they need to understand that diversification is, uh, is really shifting between the products that they grow, which are tangible products, and those that are created, which are visitor experiences. Um, so, you know, trying to educate them that, you know, customers touching and feeling and tasting products prior to purchase, which is what they're potentially used to um, uh, having some control over in terms of quality and consistency, and that they can potentially store some of the unsold product for future years. It varies quite differently when it comes to visitor experiences, which are intangible. Here, they can't create them all in advance. Uh, they have less control over the quality and consistency and the experiences are highly perishable and they can't be stored. Um, so in, in part, recognizing that, uh, you know, that, that these differences really are what's at the core of, of um, an investment decision in agritourism. We also highlighted to them that there's a continuum of exposure so they can control, you know, how much they want to um, have exposure to tourists. And this ranges from off farm encounters through gate sales, markets or restaurants where they place their products in front of their tangible products in front of visitors. And, uh, you know, to day visits on the farm and overnights on the farm. So this is where intangible products like experiences are provided on the farm. The manual signal that the deeper you go, the more changes you can expect with your farming operation and the more connected you'll have to be to this other sector called the tourism industry. So there are some trade-offs to consider. 
This precipitated numerous questions from the farms to try and understand what types of changes they could expect and if they differed based on the type of activity. Do you have the capital to invest into structures to support this activity? Uh, you don't want to invite them if you're not ready. Do you have the resources for insurance, the right zoning, buy-in from neighbors? Do you have the right skill set to be nice to people, agree with them when they're uh, not right? Uh, do you have the time or expertise to connect with the tourism side of the equation, to be marketing your experience and delivering what you promise? These are all you know, questions we ask of farmers you know, moving into it. Um, and and it, it differs ranging on the amount of exposure um, that they have. Since that time and with their input, we've created an exposure investment return continuum to help direct some of these questions. For example, selling at a local farmer's market is an example of an off-site farm encounter that would have a low to moderate investment level, low levels of risk, a moderate return via sales and exposure of the farm to the larger market, and have limited impact to change the existing farm operations other than potentially increasing the same type of operation if sales um, are for sales via off farm encounters are promising. Compare that to a farm that's perhaps hosting an on farm event during the day, such as a farm celebration or day tours, education tours. This type of activity would likely require moderate to high investments to secure the land and human financial resources to host that event. Um, and by nature of the on-farm activity, it elevates the level of risk to the farm. But the potential for return is moderate to high, depending on the number of visitors. These events can have moderate to high level of change to existing farm operations. Um, you know, for example, you may have to shift where parking occurs or the flow of uh, farm vehicles through uh, the area where the uh, day event is happening. Finally, a farm stay situation would be an example of deep exposure level. Here, some investment would be needed to secure the on-site accommodation, and by nature of having people on the property, the level of risk increases. Level of returns given that a higher proportion of daily expenditure goes towards accommodation costs would increase due to, from moderate to high depending on one's rates. And here, changes to the farm would be low to moderate, depending on uh, the concentration and location of those decisions. Shown in another way, diversification potential is mediated by the level of exposure, risk, and reward. Uh, this isn't a three-dimensional um, uh, illustration here, but hopefully you get the idea. Uh, this continuum is conceptual at this time, and it needs to be tested using um, some different activity types um, to see if some of those ratings of uh, risk levels um, uh, sort of hold true. For those researchers in attendance, uh, these are some of the important questions that merit further study. On the supply side, uh, what rewards are farmers seeking from agritourism? I uh, saw I alluded that both financial and non-financial needs. Is it profit, social goods, family employment opportunities? Um, and does this sort of motivation for reward obviously influence what they classify as a, a acceptable uh, reward risk um, ratio when they're making decisions? Which risks are farmers more sensitive to when making agritourism diversification decisions? Is a change to the farm something that they're more sensitive to um, than um, the loss of a, a parcel of land? Is it the opposite? Um, um, and does that vary by type of farm? On the demand side, what can we learn from the motivations and behavior of agritourism visitors to aid farmers in their decision-making process? Are there things uh, through better understanding of um, you know, visitor experience surveys, uh, motivation surveys um, that would help farmers um, to have more confidence in the decision making process? And I would go a little bit further um, by posing, positing some of the following propositions as well. If we can strengthen um, our knowledge here um, by proving our, or sort of um, disproving some of these or testing these propositions, I think we'd be in a better position. 
uh, first one is that the number and types of risks associated with agritourism increase with the number of visitors. Is that true? Changes associated to farm operations from agritourism increase with deeper exposure to visitors. To visitors. Investment requirements for agritourism increase with exposure to higher volumes of visitors for on-farm intangible experiences. And the highest financial returns from agritourism are experienced with high volume day experiences where intangible and tangible products are offered to visitors. This wraps up my presentation. I hope that I've provided uh, some valuable food for thought on this topic and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Did you see? Okay, if you do have any questions, please submit them on Whova, and we will move on to our next speaker. Our next speakers are uh, presenting on um, agritourism growth from peer-to-peer -peer learning, and I would like to introduce Kay Wilson and Carolyn Miller from the Scottish Agritourism Association. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this session. Um, while the slides come up, I'll just introduce myself. So my name is Caroline Miller, and this is my colleague Kay Wilson, who's going to speak after me this afternoon. And I'm the sector lead for agritourism in Scotland. And I'm here with six other of my farming colleagues from Scotland. So many of you are here today in the audience because you've been collared by them over the past few days to come to our session. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd just like to thank the Royal Highland Agricultural Society and Scottish Enterprise for um, the contributing to help us attend this conference. So we have um, a 950 acre farm on the east coast of Scotland, one hour north of Edinburgh. And we've run a five star tourism business called the Hideaway Experience since 2005. We produce Scotch beef and Scotch lamb and malting barley to make whiskey. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the sector lead for Scottish agritourism and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, since 2007, I have um, done, uh, offered a freelance consultancy service, helping farmers to diversify into agritourism. And I facilitated the Scottish Enterprise Agritourism Monitor Farm Programme, which is quite wordy, but um, I facilitated that programme. I'm going to talk today about knowledge exchange and how we're growing agritourism in Scotland by sharing knowledge between farmers. Next slide, please. I don't, is this it here? Yeah. Oh, apologies. I'm trying all the buttons. Oh, okay. So, agri tourism in Scotland. Um, so, Scottish agri tourism is the sector body. Um, there's over 300 individuals across 160 farms are working together to grow agri tourism. These are just a sample of some of our businesses and we're all working farms. And um, that is our definition of agritourism in Scotland. We must be a real working farm or croft to be um, part of our membership. We also work with other rural businesses as well in our communities, but we've got a very strong definition, um, which is very important to our consumer offering. Next slide. So in terms of growth, growth of agritourism in Scotland, it's a multi-agency collaborative approach between the private sector and the public sector. And we launched our um, sustainable growth strategy for doubling the size of agritourism by 2030. We launched that strategy at our conference last November. Visit Scotland are our national marketing agency and they help us promote agritourism to consumers globally. 
Scottish Enterprise and our enterprise agencies facility and um, run the Monitor Farm programme in Scotland, which um, I'll go on to talk about. Scottish Agri-Tourism is the membership organisation and Go Rural is the consumer facing um, brand of Agri-Tourism in Scotland. So here are some of the people involved in Agri-Tourism in Scotland. This was the very first Monitor Farm meeting, um, which was held um, at Kay and Anne's um, farm, uh, just outside Loch Lomond on the west coast of Scotland. And the programme really is about um, building trust, getting people to know each other, building networks, and then bringing people together and getting them to share knowledge with each other. Um, we all have things that we do well. We all have things that we could do better. And it's all about sharing what you're doing and helping your, your fellow farmer in a confidential manner. And this is what it's all about. Um, Kay, that's going to speak in a minute. All of us, you know, most of us, we couldn't farm without our agri-tourism business. Um, we couldn't have an agri-tourism business without the farm. The two go hand in hand. Um, and a key thing as well is that agri-tourism allows multiple people in the family to be living and working on the farm. If it was just a farm, it might be just one person or two people at certain times of the year. But because of the agri-tourism in this family, for example, there's four people working and living on the farm. Next slide, please. So the Monitor Farm Programme um, is run by Scottish Enterprise, our economic development agency. And at the core of it is the Monitor Farmers. They are chosen, um, they have to apply to be the Monitor Farmers and there's a vigorous um, interview process and then they're selected. There's a community group of people around those farms who receive additional support. They do benchmarking. They um, are in a more a confidential sharing group and um, they also receive one-to-one -one support. And then there's wider number of people and we have between 50 and 80 people come to our in-person or online meetings. And we have a whole range of things that we discuss at these meetings. We benchmark and we baseline all the businesses. So at the start of the program, we would measure somebody's turnover, number of employees, and a range of KPIs, and we track their performance throughout the whole three years of the program. So that at the end of the program, we can fully evaluate the economic impact to the economy from doing this. Next slide. One of our other monitor farmers, Stuart and Joe McNichol, they have developed this amazing cafe on the cliff edges in East Lothian. It's, out, it's made out of um, upcycled shipping containers. And just as an example, despite COVID, their turnover doubled during the Monitor Farm programme um, to about £400,000. And they also have about 25 staff now in a business that only started four years ago. Next slide. This is another example of a really innovative business. Jasmine came along to a meeting. She came along to one of the first Monitor Farm meetings. She had no idea what type of agri-tourism she wanted to do. She came along thinking she wanted to do accommodation. Um, but when she got there after a few meetings, she realized she wanted to do children's experiences and farm tours. And now they're a very established visitor attraction in the South of Scotland, welcoming hundreds of people onto their farm. Next slide. So in terms of key outputs, I'll not list the whole of these, but basically, as I say, we've been tracking what the outputs have been. People have gained confidence, invested in facilities, grown their turnover, grown their visitor numbers, despite COVID, um, invested in online booking systems. Next slide. It doesn't like me. Okay. Um, one of the things that has been a a very important part of it um, is pricing. Farmers are not very good at setting prices. Um, we're good at being price takers, but not price makers. So learning how to charge for what and value what the consumer wants will pay for your experience is really important. So we've had evidence of people just getting the pricing right and increasing their profitability by a considerable amount. 
So there's a whole lot of outputs. Um, I can share our report, I'll put it on the app, um, but there's a fully evaluated um, um, report on the programme. And uh, as I say, it's funded and um, by our Scottish government through Scottish Enterprise. So um, it's been a great thing for many businesses. I'll now hand over to Kay Wilson, who is one of the monitor farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, yes, so my, oh, sorry, next slide. Or am I meant to do it? There we go. I'll see, it might not like me, we'll try. So yeah, my name's Kay Wilson and I am first and foremost a farmer. I have enjoyed this week of swapping my wellies for wedgies. Um, it's been great to meet so many wonderful people and it's great to be able to showcase what we do in Scotland. So I'm first and foremost a farmer. This is where we farm. Um, we are a 5,000 acre hill farm. We have 1,100 black-faced sheep, 25 circular cows, and we produce lamb and beef. We are tenant farmers and we've been farming since the 1750s. I am now the 11th generation to be farming. I work together. Thank you. I got a whoop whoop. <laughs> I, I work together with my parents, Bobby and Ann Lennox, um, and my husband Doogie. Anne is in the room. You may have met her at the bar at some stage this week. And we have been running agri-tourism for 50 years. And it started off with my grandfather opening the farm for tours because we're so close to Glasgow, we're just 30 minutes. We get bus loads of vet students, journalists, in those days it would be food vloggers, but it was folk from supermarkets wanting to know where their food is produced. So he started that, not earning any money from it, but now we've worked away how we can try and monetize these tours. I'm also the destination leader for A Guile in the Isles and for Scottish agri-tourism for my area. I'm now on the board of directors as well. Our agritourism consists of a small family cottage that sleeps four. We have our bonnie barns, which have been designed and we manufacture in our lambing shed, which does create its own issues at times of the year. And um, we also do farm tours. We offer travel trade. We now have a contract with an American company, Colette, who come over once a week and we do sheepdog demonstration. My mum makes some beautiful home baking for them. We talk about the history, the heritage and how we farm. We also do Day in the Life of the Farmer, which is a great immersive experience for people to just really get their hands dirty or just stroke a sheep for the entire day, however it works. Oh, next slide, let's go down for... Oh. Um, why we became monitor farmers. So really at the time that came along, we were spinning lots of plates. I had another job to try and subsidize me on the farm. We were trying new ideas. And with the monitor farm, it was able to hone us in and give us direction. With uncertainty of farming um, and we want to be sustainable, we are about to potentially lose 50% of our income due to the subsidies going away. So we need to think of a way, how can we sustain our farm, but also sustain the next generation, which is myself and my husband. We wanted to build on the success of our grandparents and our, and our parents' success. And we wanted to really push agritourism in our area to a new level. And we wanted to open that. We knew that what's the point in just one person being part of it? You bring everybody with the journey and that's what's fantastic about the, the Monitor Farm Programme. Everyone gets to, to grow together. Okay. The community group. So we mentioned that's actually a byproduct, and it's one of the most positive things that comes from it. You have a room full of room. You have a, an area and a place where there is like-minded people who want to inspire. And you know from this conference, if you fill folk in a room like that, the only way you're going to go is go up together. And that's how it feels with this group. You're willing to be open and you're willing to share. So we'll talk about the things that we've done wrong to save the other person from making that same mistake. We had a fantastic WhatsApp group, a simple device on your phone that everyone has the ability to have. And silly questions like, we've just had a nightmare with our insurance company, we need to change. Has anyone got any recommendations? Who can we use? Very quickly, you could have five answers and it saves you hours of time and resources researching these people, you could have that answer at your fingertips. You've got a really trusting environment, which Caroline mentioned, which is the really important bit, is that you know that what you're sharing doesn't have to be confidential, but it's open and everyone is, is in open together. These are examples of two of the families. There was many families involved, but they're actually not in far from proximity to us. They're on the other side of Loch Lomond. We knew them, We'd maybe, you'd maybe wave at them at a, a farm show, or you'd have a chat, you know a little bit about them, but we actually have become very close friends now. We know we can pick up the phone to them and we'll support each other. 
each have grown in different ways and it might not seem a lot from the outside, but we know a huge difference has happened to the internal part of their family structure because of the programme. So the Scott family at Port Ellen, we were pushed on by our community, encouraging and supporting and learning so many new skills and to take our new ideas to improve the business. So they've now created an online booking system to allow more time on the water, making money rather than sitting doing paperwork in the background. Chris has now become a destination leader for his area. He's able to now cross sell. We actually work with him as well and we upsell each other's products to kind of promote the area as well. Um, and they now have a really great online and direct beef sales from their farm. Thank you. And the Duncan family farm, again, they are creating another income stream for, they've got four children who wanna be at the farm. So now with developing what they have, they now have that income available for them. Our key things that we managed to, to next slide. Um, these are our beautiful cows. This is all from our farm. We have now put succession in place. We rebranded. We've built our bonnie barns. Um, we've now taken on staff. I now have three cleaners, a financial person once a week, and I have a full-time manager, all to help me step outside the business, grow the business, and let people who know what they're doing do it better than I could. And that's been a huge difference for me. So basically, I just want to say thank you so much. We really hope you'll come to visit Scotland. You'll see there's a map that we've put out for a few of you. Look at our website uh, and come along and see us one day. And we have time for questions for the ladies. Yes. Thanks so much. Can you uh, explain what is the destination manager or destination representative that you've mentioned a couple times? Hello and welcome. My name is. Yeah. So the destination leader, it breaks. Sorry, it, are you wanting to do it? Oh, it breaks Scotland up into different regions, and it just means I look after a certain area. Somebody looks after Angus. Somebody looks after the Highlands, and they're actually all in the room today. We've got some of them in the room, and we each help with folk. We've got a community group from those on a WhatsApp group. So we're there to talk to them and help feed in information. So it's not all just going through Caroline. So we're an extra kind of person. I, I'm continuing to ask that question. So is there a job description that goes with the destination leader? And if so, can y'all share it? Absolutely, there is a job description and I can share it. You had referenced benchmarking as a part of the program. Can you describe that in a little more detail? And have you had any reticence from some of the monitor farm members in sharing financial details? Yeah, so benchmarking was a bit of a challenge, not because people wouldn't share things. It was a challenge because it is one area of the program that's um, much more effective in person, in small groups around a table, rather than doing it on Zoom. And as you know, the program had to move on to um, online because of COVID. So um, more than two thirds of the program had to be delivered online instead of in person. Um, so, but when we did start to do the benchmarking and get together, there wasn't any issues with people sharing the data. Um, what is more of an issue is the different types of agritourism. So we have many different types as, as, as been demonstrated at this conference, but we have all sorts of things from events and weddings to farm tours and accommodation. So it's, um, but the fundamentals of measuring your costs in the business and looking at your profitability and visitor numbers and things like that. Um, so we're trying to teach people the fundamentals, but I think, if there's any other programs going forward, then we'll get into much more of it in person. Okay, we have time for one more question from the gentleman in the back. Um, after uh, 11 generations, it doesn't seem to be a problem, um, but you mentioned being tenant farmers. Do you have any pressure being so close to Glasgow for land access or? I can't hear you. Um, oh, sorry, thank you. Do you have pressure for land access as a tenant, tenant farmer uh, being so close to Glasgow? No, we've been tenants for so long. It, it's That's what we farmed. You know, we're not looking to take on anything else. I'm not sure how that is for other. 
Am I going to say that the any pleasures from the want to speak about one? No. Oh, apologies. No, there, there's maybe there's sometimes discussions about they may want a wee bit of field here because they want to do something else with that land, but we've never any pressure. Um, the, the kind of right is that, that farmers are allowed to diversify and you have to have that discussion with your landlords. Uh, we've got their full permission to do that. And sometimes um, you sometimes there's a monetary in there between them, but um, it's each farm and tenant landlord is all different. All right. Thank you very much. You got the next one. Our, our next presenter, sorry to be moving along so fast, but we're just trying to stay on time. So thank you for your understanding. Our next presentation again is a remote presentation called Regional Partnerships and Funding for Impact. And this is Luis Deland, uh, Eastern Ontario Agri-Food Network. Hello and welcome. My name is Louis Bélin and I am with the Eastern Ontario Agri-Food Network. Today we are speaking about regional partnerships and funding for impact. Now, <clears throat> obviously there's a lot of approaches to, to uh, partnerships. There's a lot of approaches to funding. Um, so what I do want to do today is go over really who we are, what we do, and how we came to be. Um, it will be very general. Um, I'm not gonna go into too, too many details uh, just in terms of time, uh, but uh, always open to answering any questions uh, either uh, during this conference or or afterwards uh, via email or through you know social media, whatever. Uh, anyone can reach me and I will gladly answer any follow-up questions afterwards. All in all, I'm uh, going to go over history, mission, vision, geography, blah, 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 and then get into uh, our governance, our memberships, our funding, and then uh, finally uh, see how those apply to uh, to some of our programs. And uh, I will go over a little bit of challenges and, and where we're going next. Founded in uh, 2010, uh, the Agri-Food Network is a nonprofit membership organization uh, that coordinates the development of the local agri-food sector in eastern Ontario and fostering dialogue between members and partners uh, obviously that is a key uh, a key thing uh, that our that our organization does um, we are there to support the success of producers um, and and honestly it's about it's all about their efforts uh, you can read it in the vision down there uh, the wording is carefully thought out and applied um, we are all about uh, the local agri-food producers and their efforts to create economic, social, and environmental growth in the region. Um, for those uh, not of the area, I wanted to give a little bit of, uh, of a visual. Um, so unfortunately, I'm only participating uh, virtually uh, this year to this wonderful workshop. But uh, those that are in person, you can see where you are, Burlington, Vermont, right on the map marker. And uh, I apologize for the very roughly drawn uh, red area, uh, but that is um, that is about the uh, the coverage that our organization has in terms of uh, Eastern Ontario. On the on the left, you do see um, quite a few quite a few of the uh, the municipalities and and uh, and townships that we uh, that we cover. In terms of governance, uh, our board uh, bylaws indicate five to 12 uh, directors. Uh, now, four of those are appointed delegates from funding municipalities. Um, so I'll get into the funding in a little bit, but, uh, but we do have delegates from, from those uh, municipalities on our board. Eight are elected directors with at least one residing in each of the regions. Um, now, as, as most boards do, uh, we do try to, to get, uh, as much as much of a representation and diversity as we can on our board uh, so that starts out with language we are a, a very very bilingual uh, region both french and english uh, we do try to have uh, geography diversity uh, and then we then we hit the value chain so so anyone along that value chain farmers processors retailers 
um, you know, those are those are key members, and and we do want to have them represented on our board. Afterwards, we do have stakeholders, so agency, community, or or associations, other kind of partners, um, and obviously consumers, supporters, and the general population. Uh, now we always uh, we always extend a permanent invitation as observers to the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. They have been an incredible partner, which I will get into as well. Uh, we have two, <clears throat> excuse me, we have two CFDCs in Cornwall and, and Prescott Russell. Uh, now CFDCs are are, are uh, Community Futures Development Corporation, so they they are there to fund. Uh, projects with community impact, uh, fund projects and businesses. So very, very good partners to have. And uh, they are both extremely active and extremely impactful in our areas as well. Uh, board of Educations, uh, Boards of Education, uh, we always uh, like to have uh, them involved and obviously the on Eastern Ontario Health Unit. <clears throat> Uh, going into our memberships, uh, we do have a little bit more of a complex membership system, but uh, it it is incredibly effective, uh, to be honest. So, um, I mean, you see you see this this information here. It's all available on our website, um, but we do keep a list of just general contacts. Uh, and so, anyone who signs up for our newsletter. Uh, I do want to mention our newsletter is bi-weekly, uh, so, so, and, and it's, uh, uh, as, as a new, uh, as a new arrival in, in the network myself, I, I was, uh, extremely surprised by the very high, uh, click rates and, and, and open rates on our newsletter. Um, so very, very effective newsletter. So contacts, uh, contacts go, uh, basically anyone who signs up uh, for the newsletter. And then we have individual supporters. Uh, so those are anyone, any individual in the community that wants to support, it's $25 yearly, uh, nice and easy to pay for. And, and they get newsletter and uh, voting rights and access to, to some of our events. Um, farms is, is obviously a farm uh, in terms of revenues are not always way up there. So it is an optional uh, membership fee. So we are looking at $100, but it's optional. So those that can't afford to pay it, um, we do, you know, subsidize that with with other higher paying members. Um, and and to be honest, it, it's about, it's about 5050. I think half our half our, our farm members in this category will pay and half half don't. Uh, markets and hubs, uh, free membership. Um, so so I mean, and or host farmers uh, and products from from the region. Food businesses is is another big of our membership, another big one of our membership categories. Uh, so we're talking about non-farming food processors, handlers, retailers, and they are a hundred dollar uh, membership fee. That one is not optional. Uh, stakeholders. Uh, so any any other non-food business association partners, uh, community organization, uh, they're fixed at two fifty. And then we have quite a few uh, bigger sponsor uh, memberships, um, and those are those are key as well in our in our organization. I mean, all in all, we have a, a very balanced mix of all these membership categories, which which makes for a, for for a very very good dynamic, honestly. Uh, right into the funding, uh, so we do get core funding from municipalities, and that represents 45% of our annual revenue for the past two years. Uh, now there's there's uh, the United Counties of Prescott Russell, uh, they, they, they offer us core funding. We do have the uh, Stormont, Dundas and Glengarry counties, as well as the city of Cornwall uh, that all uh, contribute a, uh, a reasonable amount to to our to our organization now um i do want to mention it is it is actually roughly based on population as well in terms of in terms of uh what they uh what they give us for core funding membership dues and services represented about 10 percent of our uh, revenues over the past two years uh we were lucky enough to get a two-year uh omafra grant so the ontario ministry of agriculture food and rural affairs now this represented about 25% of our uh, revenues for the past two years. Uh, and, and one of the big things about this grant is, uh, you know, the key thing was that core funding from the municipalities really allows us to, uh, well, obviously pay for, for the base operations, but 
we can also leverage that core funding as as a as you know partial project funds to leverage additional subsidies and grants and that omafra one is is actually key uh, i do have a slide about it next i think um, other uh, other grants and subsidies um, represent about 10 percent you know in that i uh, in that category i throw like uh, job grants and stuff so partial partial um, uh, partial subsidies for salaries and, and whatnot and then we actually have a, a few uh, revenues coming in uh, directly from programs which represent about 10 percent of our yearly revenue as well so OMAFRA is uh, is uh, a incredible partner to have. Uh, obviously, the that that be the one thing I'd recommend to anyone uh, trying to do uh, something similar is to is to uh, find a partner like this. Um, so they had a place to grow grant. Uh, it's an agri food initiative uh, from their Canadian Agricultural Partnership, um, and over the past two years, they have covered uh, fifty percent of project costs and by project cost i mean i mean it was it was quite a few projects combined into one but they covered uh, communications marketing translation trade so staffing contractors you know 50 percent of that um i mean you saw in the previous slide it, it did represent 25 percent of our uh of our yearly revenue over the past two years so this was a two-year uh two-year grant uh that's coming to an end so um Omafra, if you're listening, let's let's chat. Honestly, let's keep this going. Um, so jumping right into some of our some of our programs, so so you can get a, a better sense of where that money goes. Um, so sample the East program, like a lot of uh, of organizations participating in uh, in this conference, uh, we do have some some circuits, some routes, some predefined kind of kind of uh, trips for people to do. Uh, we have 10 routes so far. I, I should I should say nine. Uh, we have nine on our website. The 10th ten, one is coming very, very shortly. Um, so we do we do strive for for kind of uh, the flexibility at this point for for consumers. Uh, you can print the PDFs with directions. You can download it to to your device. Uh, we offer day trips overnights and and like the stops are kind of uh, very flexible and and optional and and work within themselves uh, quite well. Meet Your Producers <clears throat> has been a incredibly successful uh, program. So, and 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 it's a it's a program that's still active actually. So so what we're looking at, excuse me, what we're looking at is a is a subsidized video production. So so the the producers only have to have to uh, pay uh, half of it, and uh, and it's a three minute video uh, to highlight the the farm, the products. Um, now, the key thing about this is, and and uh, coming from the entrepreneurial background myself, it, it's one of the um, one of the key things that I that I preach is it's all about relationships, and these videos really highlight the people, and 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 give a sense of uh, kind of creating that relationship between between our producers and and the consumers. So, uh, very very impactful. Uh, I mean, it's debatable if 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 videos are still um, are, are still pertinent in in the highly evolving uh, technology sector. Uh, and and I know that with with uh, emerging trends, we're looking at you know five six seconds videos that are popular now. But uh, but these videos really give give a sense of of who the people are behind these uh, these farms and producers. So uh, they are extremely well shared across our network. So a very successful program. Um. I, I think a lot of people do this, but but it's kind of par for the course in my mind. Uh, a, a regional food map, so uh, interactive, uh, very searchable, very filterable. Uh, you can see all the options on on the right hand there. I, I try to include them in the screenshot. Um, so you know uh, your 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 very thorough list of farms and food beverage vendors across the area. That's available on our website at all time. Um, now I do get into a little bit of challenges here. The the local food portal is is one of the projects that that uh, that that could have worked a lot better uh, if it wasn't for timing. So um, online storefront. Uh, I mean, uh, with uh, with with a pandemic hitting, um, this project was not quite uh, up to speed when the pandemic hit. 
Uh, so uh, many of our members, uh, you know, in, in terms of timing, in terms of, the, of, of reaction to, to all these uh, restrictions uh, imposed on them, uh, scrambled to have an online, um, online, uh, online storefront. Um, and so in terms of timing, this project was not quite ready. So we did not get kind of that uptake that we, uh, that we, that we wanted. So uh, this pro this particular platform uh, requires, it's, it's a storefront management. It's, it's, you know, uh, members have to manage their own storefront online. Uh, so those that went with other platforms, uh, you know, there's no need to, to manage and, and, and update two different storefronts. So um, great project not quite the uh the impact we wanted it to have uh in terms of timing uh but still ongoing and still a ton of potential um <clears throat> obviously local food uh local foods what we do um so uh, this there's a lot to do as well with with gathering of information and and broadcasting that information out having that one-stop shop for all for for consumers to to have everything they need in terms of local food. So where the local food markets are, local food hubs. Uh, we did produce some local food discovery booklets, which you can see in the picture being held uh, by our local MPP. Um, and we also do local food counter, <clears throat> which you can see as well, that signage up top in the picture. <clears throat> so we have a few of those across the area where, you know, it's, it's a big uh, food display where you can purchase local food and, and there's, uh, there's branding associated to that and a big screen with, with short videos uh, promoting the local uh, producers and vendors. So it's, all, it's, it's about the identity and it's about that, that you know, feeling of uh, uh, that trend of supporting local for one. And it's about capturing that and making it easy for people uh, to see that. A uh, very, very uh, well. Uh, other services. Um, uh, it's certainly not a complete list, but uh, there is one that I want to uh, that I didn't do a slide. I, I should have. Uh, but uh, grow an extra row. That's that. The idea is that our producers add an extra row, and and uh, you know, whatever comes out of that extra row uh, produced goes to food banks and and people in need. And uh, now that's part. That's going to be part of a much bigger project around uh, food insecurity. So uh, the Agri-Food Network, along with uh, a few other partners in the area, are coordinating a food insecurities forum. Uh, so what that is, is gathering gathering all the data from all these partners and putting it together and, and, and planning next steps in a coordinated effort to tackle food insecurity in our area. Uh, so great project, great partners on the table there as well. Uh, in terms of challenges, obviously money, people, time, <laughs> we always need more of all that. Um, I mean, money, uh, that core funding has been key uh, to, to, to progress in the past few years. Um, if, if organizations get, can get for funding, for core funding on a permanent basis, uh, that's, that's what gives that flexibility to go get more uh you know reality of life you need money to make money uh people um i'm all about relationships uh sometimes uh, government funding can create some conflict within an area depending on organizations and who gets what and and who does what uh so it's all about working together at this point um you know the it, it's not about who gets what who gets what money in the end it's about the people that are being helped in the community and time, I should say time and timing, as I've explained with the uh, with the local food portal project. Uh, but uh, honestly, the Agri-Food Network's progress in the past few years is a result. Uh, I'm proud of my sentence there. It's a result of miraculously consistent juggling and priorities by extremely competent, passionate and devoted people. Um, the previous executive director, uh, Tom Manley, did an incredible job building this over the past two years. And the board of directors, they're all volunteers, by the way. I hadn't mentioned that, but they are, are, are all a volunteer board uh, of, of very, very dedicated people. Um, and, and they've done a wonderful job over the past two years. And uh, in terms of next step, um, and strategy. I mean, we have to use this this the foundations that were built over the past few years to increase core funding, um, and 
And the idea is to be that one-stop shop for consumers to purchase local food products. Um, there's, as you've, as you've seen, uh, there's a ton of initiatives. Uh, so we do want to bring all that under uh, one single clear message and brand. That brand is going to be about local food. Uh, there's a lot of areas across the world that, that, that promote uh, a single brand, a uh, single food brand. And that will be the key uh, and, and current next step uh, for the Agri-Food Network and already underway, I should say. And that brand is really going to be used to rally producers together. So, I mean, as soon as, as uh, a proportion of local producers identify as part of this region and part of this brand, it, cre it becomes something a lot more powerful. And, and that's what kind of creates that that destination that we want to create it's all it's all about being a destination and there's there's a there's many many examples uh across the world of of regions that do that and and that's really where we are at the agri food network we're right on that on that uh i will well, say on the cusp of 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 uh of launching that brand i wish i could have done so uh for this conference but uh, we were not quite ready for it yet uh, but that is coming soon, and uh, and and like I said, it's 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 to rally producers under that brand, and make it extremely attractive con to consumers. Um, so I'm going to stop there in terms of timing. Uh, obviously, the Eastern Ontario Agri Food Network story is not over by any means. To be continued. Please keep in touch. Uh, our website is there. Uh, all the information I gave today is available on our website. And as I mentioned, I will be more than happy to answer any questions uh, during this event or afterwards uh, at that email you see on the screen. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So as Monsieur Bélan mentioned, questions can be directed there. We are going to go next to Penny Leff and Lisa Frank of Farmstay USA. And I have a huge thank you to Penny for stepping in as the moderator. And they will be telling us about cultivating partnerships that strengthen U.S. Farmstays and their association. Not working. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm. So I'm Penny Leff, and uh, I'm a board member of the U.S. Farm State Association, which is a 501c3 trade association of farm stay owners, farm stay and ranch stay operators in the United States. And presenting with me today is Lisa French, who is development strategist with Farm Stay USA. Uh, so we're gonna start with a little background. Did our slide go away? What happened? Ah. Um, anyway, a little background. Um, many years ago, as you've heard many times in this last few days, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of Americans um, had a relative who farmed and they could go visit their grandpa or uncle or grandma on the farm. And that's been two or three generations since that happened. And most people, most people in the United States now don't know anybody living on a farm. And uh, farms are pretty foreign and agriculture is pretty unknown to most people in this country. However, in Europe, it's different. In Europe, farm stays are, have been well-developed for quite a few years now. They've been supported by the government. Next slide, please. Does that work? Can you do next slide? Okay. Um, where's my clicker? Oh, there's my clicker, okay. Okay, so staying on a farm or a ranch. Uh, well, in Europe, it's it's been popular. Um, however, uh, in the United States, um, farm stays haven't been so well known, but guest ranches and dude ranches have been pretty popular over most of the 20th century. 
um, partly because the cattle market collapsed and they had to do something else. So they invited visitors and the railroads came in and the Western cowboy culture was very romantic and people started uh, going out and doing ranch stays and, and going to guest ranches. And the Dude Ranch Association started in 1926 and helped promote and organize ranch stays. But popularity of farm stays was a whole lot slower to grow because people, most Americans kind of thought farms, well, farms are sort of dirty and boring and who'd want to go to a farm? And, um, and they were kind of worried. They'd heard that if you go to a farm, they put you to work and they make you shovel out the barn and stuff. And, and so farm stays didn't have a good reputation. They weren't understood once people didn't have relatives to visit. Um, and so and that's partly because currently less than 2% of Americans are involved in agriculture and they don't have that family connection. And let's see. On the supply side, farm stays were also slow to grow because farmers are kind of have the same sort of illusions, like who would want to come visit us? And why is anybody interested in coming to a farm? Or, you know, it, it, it's like, and farmers had a hard time believing anyone would want to visit. And also most farmers were pretty unfamiliar with the hospitality industry and what would be involved in having guests on your farm. How do you even do that? Um, and so it was, it was kind of slow, slow growth there. But then COVID came along and demand just boomed and everybody wanted a remote place to stay with their family. Uh, so that was a, a real positive for, for existing farm stays. But let's go back and go back a few years. In 2010, Scotty Jones, who is owner of Leaping Lamb Farm in Alsi, Oregon, that's a small sheep ranch in Alsi, Oregon. Uh, she launched the U.S. Farm Stay Association. She went national from her small sheep ranch. Uh, to support and promote um, other agritourism operators. And she did that with a little bit of grant support. And um, the U.S. Farm Stay Association offers services to farm stay operators. Primarily a website is the major service, a national website that Scotty's been running for 10 years. And the website promotes members to potential visitors nationally. The association also um, supports, uh, provides connections, provides a forum for farm stay operators to talk to each other online, provides education, helps them get started, and supports members with their questions as they move forward. And Scotty and her staff also promote uh, members to the media and get a lot of journalists going out to the farms, doing feature stories, getting good press for farm stays individually and in general. So they have done a lot to build the farm stay industry. And there's also associate members um, who provide goods and services to members and they're mutually beneficial and they, they're also on the site. And they do all that with a staff of 1.5 and a volunteer advisory board. And then COVID came along. And uh, as, we, as we talked about COVID, um, oh wait, I'm gonna go back a minute. I missed some things about growing pains. I know these are hard things to talk about. When Scotty started the, the website, she did some research, she found 800 farm stays and ranch stays in the country. And she listed them all on the site. And she didn't charge them for that because she had this little bit of grant support to get started. And then that ran out. And in 2012, she asked for a membership payment to stay on the site with a full listing. And the full listings declined by 85% because people didn't want to pay. But there was 
but she still kept the others on, listing their names and a little bit of minimal information about them. So people could, of course, go right to their website and find them. And then in 2018, there was a website revision, a website um, update. And at that point, only paid members were invited to continue to stay with full listings. And that dropped the number of listings, the number of members who were willing to pay for, for being on the site down to 140. And with a little work that uh, Lisa's gonna talk about, the current membership is at 240. Um, currently stands at 240. So we'll go back to, to COVID. So COVID was a boom for farm stays. They were fully booked after, after a few months and everybody got over the shock of staying home. They looked around to where they could bring their family and they went to farm stays. They looked for remote locations to bring their family. And it was busy, traffic increased to the website. Um, farm stays were fully booked, but membership didn't increase to the association because they didn't need it. Farm stays were, were doing fine. They had plenty of people coming out there. COVID worked for them. Um, so uh, where are we? So currently more members are needed to increase the marketing, increase the website visits, uh, we really need to, to build this organization uh, to maintain it, uh, both from the fees of the membership and to get to have more, more uh, variety of farm stays for people to search when they go to the website. So you, Farm Stay USA is now funded entirely by the members, uh, by the Farm Stay operator members. Um, and We've did a little, Scotty did a little break even figuring. Um, the total expenses for the website and the one and a half staff is $108,000. Uh, with the membership only, paid membership only, this would pay, take 478 paying members. But if we could find $60,000 worth of sponsorship or associate members, or other ways to help finance the association, it would be pretty much sustainable with the memberships that's there and the membership and the association could survive. Now it's up to Lisa. Come on up. No, that's you. Hello. I am the 0.5 of the Farm Stay Association. I am a development strategist, so I'm looking for, you know, a variety of pathways to help the association survive for decades to come. Um, I also, I live in Northwest Georgia. Um, I am working at a, a little over 5,000 acre farm. So it's incredibly diversified, lots of accommodation. Um, but how I got uh, connected to Farmstay USA is because I was working as a business development director for a booking platform called Yonder. Um, Yonder was a OTA that specialized in connecting people to the natural world. So painting a different narrative of how we look at nature connection, not just the wonderlust um, uh, kind of promotion of nature that we see, um, hiking and going to beautiful cabins, which mind you, that's amazing. I'm just saying that getting your hands dirty and going to farms and getting to know the local community was something that Yonder was looking to achieve. So Yonder discovered uh, the Farm Stay Association because they were looking for a global localization model, um, a boots on the ground team that would access their target market and would allow them to advance the business, but leverage subject matter experts to really round out the brand um, and connect with the farmers. So this was critical for the association because it provided the necessary working capital. Um, it, uh, you know, the association was able to have four employees to do all of the operations 
do onboarding um, and provide that additional marketing that was both beneficial for Yonder as well as the association. So the deal specifically allowed a one-year free basic membership with Farms the USA and a year of merchant fees only um, on all reservations. Um, and that, that listed, that were listed on Yonder and were linked via the farm stay listing. The, some of the highlights of the benefits of it was that Yonder paid for you know, all of the staff. 90% um, of Farm Stay USA members joined Yonder and received free Farm Stay USA basic listing and the, all the benefits that the association provides. Um, the association was able to double their membership, which was amazing. Um, and then the promotion and booking by Yonder website raised an awareness of farm and ranch stays in the US. What I will say, I did not say this, is that Yonder is no longer in business. It folded in January, unfortunately. That is why I am here with Farm Stay Association. Um, and what was I gonna say? What was I gonna say? Oh, uh, they had a very aggressive global localization model. So working with the UK, Italy, Germany, South Africa. So it positioned US farm stays it put them in front of a global audience, which was really important. You said down to go to the next one? All right. So we are looking for new partners. Um, we are taking a, a different approach, um, no pun intended on this, but looking to um, partner with companies like Subaru to be the vehicle basically that drives guests to the farms. Um, companies like Imperfect Foods, Carhartt, uh, we're even looking at this company called Stardew Valley. I don't know if anyone's a gamer or ever heard of it, but uh, it's a simulation role-playing game that essentially follows a character that has to take over their grandparents' farm. It's a dilapidated farm and um, is tasked to re revitalize it basically through agritourism. Um, that is a, uh, an entrance point for some people when they think about agritourism and staying on a farm. So we're looking at ways to partner with some of these companies that can elevate farm stays um, and build momentum and community. So it's a win-win for partners um, and it also will provide uh, farm stay members, you know, an ease of booking solution. That's what Yonder was critical for. Possible insurance. We know that insuring and having, you know, liability coverage is really difficult to have an umbrella policy. Uh, global consumer awareness of US farm stays expanded scope of the Farm Stay Association's program and services. We're really looking to build out the portfolio so that we can better serve our members, um, increase membership, and then just a greater resilience and independence uh, community of farm stays, not having to rely on OTAs. Um, so aligning with aligning the association with like minds. So a lot of the guests that we see are using the, uh, the platform um, are you know anywhere from 25 to 50, they're female, they're outdoors enthusiast, families, college educated. So we're looking to align ourselves, like I said, with brands like Subaru or REI or some of these that have similar audiences so that you know we can build that necessary momentum. Um, benefits for the sponsors and partners, uh, it's connecting them with authentic working farmers and ranchers. Uh, it's a national partner and advocate for their product and service. An example of this, one of our members uh, at Skurlock Farms in the Texas Hill Country recently had Carhartt come out to her property and film one of their commercials. Um, and that drove a lot of business to her, her property and also complimented their brand and was they were able to tell their brand story through their commercial. Um, and then uh, an opportunity, yeah, to, to fulfill their brand values. Da, da, da. Current efforts. So with the hope of gaining the necessary capital to move forward, uh, we are looking at the membership structure, different sponsorships, how to diversify the different pathways, uh, collaborating with our partners to evolve the future of farm stay. So understanding what is it that they're looking for and how can we make sure that we build that into uh, the, a new business model, essentially. 
Um, and then identifying sponsors that, again, help provide the necessary capital can also offer additional tools and services and programs, and then would you know, mutually benefit from the partnership. So I think we're at time. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be here the rest of the day if you have questions. Thank you. In moving along with the schedule, um, Lisa and Penny, if you wouldn't mind just staying in the room for 20 minutes, we have one more session and then afterwards you could approach them directly to ask your question. But I'm very excited to invite Colette de Phelps up here for the last session, um, particularly of interest to me as the manager of the Vermont Farmers Market Association. We're going to hear about leveraging farmers market impacts to develop and elevate farm to table culinary agritourism in rural Idaho. Thank you. Thanks everyone for sticking in with the conference and this session. I'm Colette DeFaults. I'm an area extension educator with the University of Idaho. And I've been with the university for five years in a position called community food systems. So I support the development of food systems from farm to end user. Prior to being with the university, I um, co-founded and directed a nonprofit organization for small acreage farmers and ranchers for about 20 years. So overall in the geographic region that I work, I've been working in food systems for about 30 years. So today I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing with colleagues, both at the university and in the community to really look at some of the impacts of our, what I consider culinary tourism being like the farmer's market component, moving into looking at festivals and how understanding those impacts can result in different collaborations and policy that ultimately support farms and ranches. And what I think is very important authentic and transparent relationships to agriculture. So I'm going to talk about where Moscow is, um, a little bit about the farmer's market and describe how we developed an economic contribution study, some of the outcomes, and then what has come from that work. So Moscow, Idaho, you can see in the large map, we are in the Pacific Northwest. We're often called the Inland Northwest. We are a state that is over 70% public land, traditionally agriculture and forestry. Moscow, as you can see, is in the Northern part of Idaho. And that Northern part that I serve is about, um, it's actually a little bit bigger than Vermont, if you wanna think about the size. We are the traditional homelands of the Nimipu, which you might know of the Nez Perce people, the Palouse and the Coeur d'Alene peoples. So Moscow itself is a town that is today probably about 25,000, but just over 23,000 in 2018 at the time of our economic assessment. And so we are a rural area in North Idaho. We only have one town that's over 50,000. We don't have a lake. We don't have a beautiful mountain range. We have a beautiful landscape of dryland agricultural production, particularly wheat and pulses, but we don't have a major tourist attraction. We are the location of University of Idaho, which is the land grant and eight miles away in Washington in a town of about 33,000 is Washington State University, which is also the land grant. For those of you that are not from the US, the land grants are the agricultural based schools within each state, we have generally one land grant university. Moscow has a really vibrant downtown. We have very few storefronts that are empty. We have several farm to table restaurants. We um, are walkable. Our landscape, um, I think walkability is a, a hallmark of our town compared to some of our other towns that are more hilly. And um, in 2018, there were approximately 344 firms operating in our downtown corridor, and that had over 3,600 workers, so a very vibrant area. The Moscow Farmer's Market is now 46 years old. It was actually established by the Moscow Food Co-op, and our Moscow Food Co-op is our community-owned retail natural food store. 
It was started by a small group of people a couple years before the farmer's market, and it has always had a mission to be anchored in downtown. So even though the co-op could actually, based on feasibility studies, make more money if it located elsewhere in Moscow, it is chosen to be downtown because it knows that it's a draw. Um, a couple years into the formation and operation of the farmer's market, it was taken over by the city of Moscow and is now operated by our city. We have a quasi-governmental um, board, the Farmer's Market Commission, on which I serve, that sets, um, essentially recommends the policies of the market, and then those policies go to city council, who actually votes on whether or not to adopt them. So it's May through October, every Saturday, on our main street. Our main street is closed down for this event. So in 2018, um, I worked with a, several community members and a colleague out of our College of Business and Economics, Steve Peterson, to do an economic impact contributions assessment of the Moscow Farmers Market. Oftentimes we say economic impact assessment and in the terms of economists, when you're talking about economic impacts, you're talking about if we built it, this is what could happen. When we're talking about eco economic contributions, we're talking about ex what is happening as a result of something existing. So we took data from some rapid market assessments that I led, a vendor survey of sales, interviews with businesses in the downtown corridor, particularly those that were incubated in the market and then grew to have a brick and mortar. And then they went into in, an in-plan model, which is um, impact analysis for planning. It's an economic modeling software that actually gave the final results that I'll be showing. So we did some customer counts and this was important to our methodology. So these are all estimates and I have to emphasize that this methodology gives you an estimate of the contributions. And so to our surprise, when we did adult customer counts, we found that we did three times during the 2018 season, over 10,000 adults were coming to our market on average, which is astounding for a community of about 23,000 that includes the college students in that number. We knew we had a robust market, we just didn't know how robust it was. And that we had you know, between 1,200 and 1,700 children attending as well. So this market is a family affair. We asked people how much they intended to spend at the market, how much have you or will you spend on the market. We used dot posters. We had about 1,000 responses, so a 10% response rate of households, so not individual adults, but households, people got one dot per household so we could figure out what that spending in that shopping basket was. Based on understanding how many people were at market, estimating how many shopping groups that was, we estimated that um, we could have upwards of almost $150,000 in spending at the market, um, lowest estimates being just over 100,000. And this is in one market day. We also asked what people intended to spend outside of the market, but we first asked downtown in July. People said they were gonna spend in downtown because they came to market between 65 and $82,000 in the businesses around downtown that day. Um, when we asked the question larger of Moscow, in our next assessment, we see that that number went up to about 87,000 to over almost $110,000. We also asked where people came from. And we know that about 50% of the people that come to the farmer's market are from outside of Lataw County where Moscow sits. And that's a really key understanding of what is the draw. We can assume that those people, if we didn't have the market, would probably not be in Moscow, downtown and spending. And so the numbers of the contribution are really based not on local spending, but on that spending that other people are doing outside the community. Because we can figure if people were already in our community, they would be spending money probably on food and goods. Maybe we'd have some leakage that would go out, but, most people, most of the spending is coming from new people in terms of economic contributions. So what we found is that the market created about 113 jobs in our community and about almost two and a half million dollars in salaries during the market season. 
with a total economic output of almost 6.5 million, which is pretty astounding for a six month, one day event. And um, the contributions in terms of taxes, like locally in terms of the city is almost $140,000. And then in terms of the state, about 266,000. And so this is really a revenue generator. And what was happening at the Farmers Market Commission about the time we were doing this were a lot of conversation about, well, the city's investing money in the market, but the market doesn't pay for itself. And maybe we should be increasing vendor fees. And there, you know, so those of you involved in markets, you know, this push and pull. Well, we are now able to show that actually based on this economic contributions assessment, the city is making almost $70,000. So they said that they had a small operating deficit of 70,000. That's what they had, were not recouping from vendors fees, but we cannot see that they're making almost $140,000. So we can change the dialogue about the market being an expense to the market being revenue generating. And I think that's really important as we move forward and we're able to have some data that talks about the work we do and the return on investment, especially when we have our public entities that are investing in our culinary or agritourism enterprises. So along the time that this was happening, we're having community conversations that started out as, should we have a maker space? Should we have some type of creativity that was going to bring something to our community? And what a broad range of community members said is, um, actually, we really want to focus on local foods and our local food identity, which was really interesting because the majority of people we were talking to are not involved in the food and agriculture sector. And as a result, um, I started working really closely with George Scandalous. George is co-owner of two farm-to-table restaurants in Moscow. He, uh, he's not from our area, he's Peruvian and Greek, and he brings a really different perspective of like the LA restaurant industry. And he has been like major in terms of supporting agriculture. Uh, Jenny Ford, she's the director of the Moscow Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center, and then Tyler Palmer. And Tyler is the deputy director of operations for our city. So we had developed this concept of developing an Idaho Culinary Institute and then COVID-19 hit. And with that, we saw a lot of changes where we didn't know what we were gonna do. Farmers lost their markets in terms of the restaurants, the restaurants were struggling. We had developed a concept paper for the Culinary Alliance that we were, um, I think I said Institute, I meant Idaho Culinary Alliance that we had been taking out outside of Moscow and developing, it actually became the foundation for developing a statewide organization called Fair Idaho, which is a trade association now that represents independence from farm all the way through beverage, um, restaurant, retail, and other establishments. And we had a lot of meetings locally in Moscow that ended up with the development of the Downtown Business Association. So in some ways, the crisis of COVID coalesce at the state level and at the local level, some partnerships that we had really been focusing on building. And the need that came out of that is actually resulting in some remarkable things. One of the conversations that we were having is like, we need an opportunity to have more community events that don't separate out adults and children. And in the US beer gardens are something that most cities require where the adults are separated if they want to drink some type of beverage in our area, uh, farm to glass, whether that's wine, spirits, or beer are becoming really big in terms of agritourism. And so uh, Tyler had taken to the city this idea that we could have this entertainment district where we would eliminate those barriers and we could have open containers and family events and festivals. And we had this economic data from the farmer's market that said these types of events can be super effective in terms of bringing families together. So we now have a Moscow entertainment district and um, the yellow is the footprint of our farmer's market. Community groups and the city itself can apply to shut down parts of these streets to close them off and then have these open containers. So this is something if you go to Moscow, Idaho city, you can get that ordinance that supports this entertainment district. 
So what we've seen is that through our downtown business association, we have developed festivals. We are branding ourselves as the Fest City. Um, I'm in the process of doing an updated post-pandemic economic contributions assessment of the Moscow Farmers Market. And then this coming year, we've run these festivals one time. We are going to do an economic contributions assessment of the festivals as well. And this is really feeding into what our city's doing around street planning because we're going to have a refresh. So we have an opportunity to feed into a refresh process that will put in infrastructure to support these types of events. And then one of the things that I'm most excited about is that we now have an Inland Northwest Artisan Grains experience and beer fest that is bringing our local artisan grains into that food space. So if you have any questions, please let me know. And um, all of the data that I shared, you can find on my website, which is idahofoodworks.org. Thank you. We do have, we have time for some live questions. If anybody has a question. Yes. Just a comment for you, uh, Colette. Um, I, we have a farmer's market in, uh, across the lake and, um, what we often hear from the main street, uh, businesses is that the farmer's market tends to rob, you know, their yeah. businesses, but we, what you're showing and, and what we've kind of known anecdotally is a lot of people after the farmer's market, if there's no food there, they'll go into town, have lunch and it's a quick walk up main street. It's very walkable as well, where our farmer's market is. So I, I really appreciate that, uh, the, um, economic study you did. Yeah, thank you. And you know, one of the things that we do is that this, this technique has four dots, four questions. And so you can ask the question, where do you come from? Is the market the primary reason you came to town today? How much will you spend? And then you have a narrative that can actually talk to the people that are concerned about the market, taking away business versus adding business. We do have a question from an online participant. Um, they wonder if there is an impact of a farmer's market across the uh, nearby in that town in Washington where the other college is. Oh, so in, in Pullman, Washington, we I don't have an impact assessment of that market. That is a Wednesday market. So it's, in some ways it does compete with vendors for our market. In other ways it does not because it's not on the same day. Um, as you can imagine in a rural community, there's not really a Saturday market that can really compete with the power of the Moscow farmer's market. I, I would like to add a suggestion if you don't, haven't already done it. Um, I'm familiar with the uh, US farm, um, Farmers Market Association, and I think they'd be really interested in learning about your study and your methodology that other markets would love to do this. That, that's a great idea. I have not contacted them about this study. Just a suggestion. Other questions? I think we have time for another question or two. Hi, Colette. Um, my only question is, how can I help? So it, let's uh, stay in. Saturday stay in the 10th, you <laughs> can come and be one of the people that helps with the rapid market assessment at the Moscow Farmers okay. Market. That's our next data collection day. <laughs> oh, another question. I'm sorry. I just want to ask, how did you collect the information? Did you, were you there on foot collecting it? by people walking around or was it an online survey? It was through four dot posters. So we had four flip charts and um, on the flip charts, there was questions. And this is all in the report that kind of explains it and the methodology. And so each household got four dots. We asked them to take a minute to help out the market. They came, they answered the questions. They said where they were from, how much they anticipated spending in market. There were clothes answered and how much they anticipated spending, eating or shopping in either downtown or Moscow, depending on the day of the assessment. So we didn't do interviews. We never had to say, will you be part of a survey? That's a turnoff. It, we just said, can you take a minute to help the, out the market? Did you have a chance to do the dots? 
people get really excited about this kind of assessment. I do it with markets for a lot of different questions. Um, my colleague Steve has done it on a tourism trail called the Centennial Trail, really looking at people. So it's a really adaptable and exciting way that you can connect with people. And then we had um, interview data that was one-on-one -on -one interview with businesses about that had spun off from the market about their employees and their sales and things that went into that business information component. I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay, let me get you on the mic. Um, are there any students involved in those surveys that, um, is it volunteers like, uh, you know, that there are some students does for part of their studies? Thank you. Well, my interns have been heavily involved when I have summer interns and we did have a Washington State University student volunteer this summer. And usually these happen during the time that the universities are on recess for summer, though we know that we have a larger contingent of student volunteers that are coming this on Saturday, September 10th, because school's back in session. So there's, yes, it is limited by the timing year that we actually do the assessments. All right, well, I want to let you all go and get a little bit of a break um, before the next block starts. So make some connections, find all of our presenters that are in the room, and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Sure.